All right, many of you have been diving into the book of Hosea already this week, and so it's going to come to a culmination today. Um, let me give you the three movements at which we're going to work through the book of Hosea. First, I'm going to tell you the story. And then I am going to tell you the story behind the story. There's theological uh, implications that are in this story that we need to see. So first I'm going to tell the story, then I'm going to explain the story behind the story, then I want to bring the story home to you with some applications, okay? So first, let me just, let me tell the story. God spoke to a prophet named Hosea, and he said, go take a wife. Now let's just stop here. Hosea is like, that's what I'm talking about, Lord. I mean, if you wanted me to be single for the rest of my life, I could do it. But um, I'm just not mad at your decision. So you want me to take a wife, I'll do it. This week I met with um, Rome's. And they were sharing their salvation testimony. And they were also sharing how they met one another. And Peter said he was praying for a woman with brown hair and brown eyes. And then God brought Stephanie who has brown hair and brown eyes. Maybe Hosea had a similar request. You know, God send me uh, uh, an extrovert who, who has, who's tall blonde hair, blue eyes. I mean, we all know how common they were among the Jewish women. And, and so God sets up just this blind date through eHarmony. Hosea doesn't, doesn't even get to see a profile picture. They're, they're usually a lie anyway, aren't they? But God tells him, I want you to go to the red light district and find a woman standing on the side of the street wearing immodest clothing, red high heels. Hosea, that's your new wife. Now, Hosea has to go down in history as the man who received the worst ministry assignment ever. I mean, and to make it worse, her name was Gomer. She wasn't quite the princess that Hosea always dreamed of marrying, but it was God's choice for him. So he goes and he meets her, and she probably just throws out a price to him. And he says, no, you don't understand. I'm not interested in paying you for an act. I want to rescue you from this lifestyle. I want to take you to a two-story house, a white picket fence, with a trampoline in the backyard, dogs running around, kids everywhere. I want to do for you what a husband should do. I want to provide for you. I want to protect you. I will never leave you. I will never take you for granted. I will never bring up your former lifestyle. I will treat you like you deserve to be treated. I will treat you like a princess. And no doubt, standing on that street corner, she probably just broke down into tears at the grace to which was just shown to her. On their wedding day, she walks down the aisle in, in a white wedding dress. She tells him on the altar, I, Gomer, take you, Hosea, to be my lawfully wedded husband, to have and to hold. From this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. And it was, it was a wonderful marriage for a time. But shortly thereafter, Gomer started stepping out, hiding text messages, being secretive, staying out all night. Hosea would ask, honey, where were you last night? She'd say, I just, I had to spend some time with friends. Look, I, I need some space. Then one day she tells Hosea, She's expecting a child, and he's so excited. He's thinking, this, this is what we need. This is going to keep her home. And on the day of the delivery, they both heard some sweet, a sweet sound. It's a boy. Hosea wanted to name him Kyle because Kyles are typically pretty ripped. But God audibly speaks to him and says, no, his name is going to be Jezreel. Shortly after, she conceives again. This time, it's a girl. Then later, she has a third. It's a boy. God spoke up each time and named the child. However, the children couldn't hold off the adultery that was in Gomer's heart. Gomer eventually returned to her old ways, to her old lovers. Now she's stepping out, but not in, not in the secret of night. She's stepping out in broad daylight. And everyone's asking, man, isn't that, isn't that Hosea's wife? She would spend weeks at a time MIA. I mean, 
We've all seen this pattern before. Hosea would look for her. Have you seen my girl? Have you seen Gomer? Man, I'm sorry, I haven't seen her. Did she step out on you again? Yeah. Behind his back, all of Hosea's boys and their wives would say, man, what did he expect? He married a hooker. One's a hooker, always a hooker. Now you have to remember that God didn't share this command to marry a prostitute with the whole town. He only shared it with Hosea. She leaves Hosea for some man who pays her for comfort. And she doesn't want to be found this time. She screams at Hosea, stop coming after me. Stop bringing the kids near me. I don't want to be put on this guilt trip. I deserve to be happy. I'm done with you. And I'm done with them. Great mother, right? So Hosea left. He left to raise the kids. Keller says the name of the third child means not my child. It wasn't Hosea's baby. John Piper says that the text does not say for sure that the last two children were Hosea's. Time passed. Hosea thinks it's all over. He will never see her again until he hears a familiar voice. God. And it says... Go again and win back your wife. Hosea's like, God, I don't even know where she's at. She doesn't want me. She doesn't even want our kids. God just keeps saying, go again, go again. So he hires a, a babysitter. And then he goes out looking day and night, and here's what he finds. When Gomer left him, she left him for another man. And then another and then another, until eventually she becomes a streetwalker. And she's still with a lover, and he has put her up for sale. He's likely a pimp. She has lost her marketability, and he was cutting his losses. So Hosea goes where the people who are human trafficked go. He goes to the auction. He busts through the doors. He said, I'm looking for my wife. Have you seen her? Her name is Gomer. He's rushing from table to table. He runs to the bar and he asks the bartender, have you seen my wife? Her name is Gomer. The bartender looks at the auctioning schedule and he says, there's a Gomer coming up. Is that her? Is that your wife? Hosea looks to this raised platform and sees a frail bruised, worn-out woman. Scholars say that she would have been stripped naked so potential buyers could see what they were bidding on. She probably had her eyes closed to shield herself from the embarrassment. She's hearing so many voices. And then she hears one that she recognizes. She thinks, it's no way. It's no way he can be my husband. It's no way it can be Hosea. She opens her eyes. She sees him. Hosea yells out, Gomer, I'm here. Gomer, I'm not leaving without you. Gomer, I'm bringing you home. The auctioneer's receiving bids from all over the room. Hosea just keeps his hand raised. He's going to buy back his wife. Nothing will stop him. Eventually, all bidders fall by the wayside. Because honestly... She just wasn't worth the money. He runs to her. The guards stop him. They say, look, dude, you got to pay first. So he goes to the auction banker. He bought her for 15 shekels of silver, a homer, and some barley. She was sold for the average price of a slave. And purchasing Gomer evidently broke Hosea financially. And here's how we know that. Scholars say that 30 shekels was the going price of a slave in those days. And the fact that Hosea could only come up with 15 shekels and had to pay the rest with Homer and Barley indicates that he didn't have the rest. I mean, you could just hear the men at the bar slamming down their shot glasses laughing. Man, he really overpaid for that one. 
After many, many sleepless nights, Gomer runs into Hosea's arms. He puts his coat around her, kisses her forehead, kisses her lips. He just covers her with grace. She's home. She needs a bath, some clothes, probably an HIV test, but she's home. He brings her home and it's like she's never left. He wants her all the way back. He will not keep her at a distance. He will not go historical on her, always bringing up her past. He's bringing her back like nothing ever happened. That's the story. Now I want you to see the story behind the story. There are theological significances in this text that I want you to see. There's more that's going on than appears. Many Old Testament prophets didn't merely just speak what God gave them, but they lived the message. And God sometimes asked his prophets to do some crazy things. He commanded Jeremiah to walk around preaching with a yoke around his neck. I got a picture of that. Can you imagine? He, he commanded Ezekiel to lay on his side for 390 days on his right side and then on his left side for 40 days. He commanded Isaiah to walk around naked and barefoot for three years. I didn't bring a picture. No need to look at that. God, God commands Hosea. This command, love your unfaithful wife. Like I love my unfaithful wife. Look at this summary. Hosea's unfaithful wife was Gomer. God's unfaithful wife was Israel. The sin that Gomer committed against Hosea, Israel committed against God. <coughs> She's running around on Hosea and God says, my people are running around on me. God and his prophet are both married to prostitutes. Hosea's marriage was to be a living parable. God is playing out a redemptive drama. He's saying, before you preach to my harlots, I want you to marry a harlot. Now let's, let's clear up some differences that we find in the text. Just clear up some stuff in the text. There's some debates about this passage, mainly in two areas. The first area is some say that the marriage never really happened historically. That it was an allegory. But I don't think so. I think the whole story breaks down if it was allegorical. Plus, the narrative includes numerous details uncalled for were the intent symbolism. Like the fact that she was the daughter of Deblaine. The third child was not born until after the second one was nursed. And the exact payment for Gomer, such Details belong to history, not allegory. The second area of debate is if Gomer was a prostitute before marriage or after marriage. Kevin DeYoung, a um, Presbyterian that I, I look up to, believes that she was a loose woman before but not an actual prostitute until after she left Hosea. J. Mack holds to the same position. So scholars fall everywhere there. P Pfeiffer says that that's a sleight of hand. I actually believe that she was a prostitute before and after. Either way, it doesn't change the picture that God is portraying. Now, there are three children in the story. You may remember that God named all three children. And it's not the first time that God named a prophet's child. He named Isaiah's child. But notice the, the three names here. The first child was named Jezreel. Jezreel reflects a geographical location. It was a historical site for many military confrontations. It was a place of blood, grisly murders, a reminder that sin will be punished. It'd be like naming your child Pearl Harbor. Oh, he's a handsome little fella. What is his name? Pearl Harbor. Oh, okay. And then the next one was named No Mercy. Can you imagine naming your child No Mercy? It'd be like naming your daughter Terminator. Doesn't Terminator look precious in that pink dress over there? And, and then the third child was a boy named Not My People. I want you to see that the prophets, and especially Hosea, they were really prosecuting attorneys announcing judgment on the ten tribes of Israel that would be fulfilled in just a few years. Now this is a different approach for us. 
we typically walk very slowly through a book. But we're not doing that with the book of Hosea because it's meant to be read in one setting. But I want you to get a picture of the entire, the entire book. So notice this outline of the book here. What do the first three chapters deal with? An adulterous wife and a faithful husband. Chapter 1 deals with Hosea and Gomer. Matt Carter, one of my friends who pastors the Austin Stone Community Church in Austin, Texas, he was asked one time, what would you do if, if your wife left you and entered into prostitution? I don't know who would ask that question, but they asked it. He said, well, I would resign my ministry, and then I would spend the rest of my life trying to win her love back. That's what you see happening in chapter 1. Then in chapter 2, you have God and Israel. Chapter 2 is a parallel between Hosea's relationship to Gomer and God's relationship to Israel. And then in chapter 3, you have both parties reconciled. Hosea and Gomer, God and Israel. Dr. James Montgomery Boyce, who pastored the 10th Presbyterian Church in Philly, he, he edited and really published a series of sermons on Hosea. And his title for chapter 3 was this, The Greatest Chapter in the Bible. Indeed. It's pretty great. And then notice the second half of the book from chapters 4 through 14. It's adulterous Israel and a faithful God. So Israel is found guilty, Israel is put away, and Israel is restored to the Lord. As Hosea was commanded to love Gomer again in spite of her unfaithfulness, God will restore Israel to his favor in spite of her sin. Okay, so... I told you the story. I told you the story behind the story. Now I want to bring it home. And I want to do that by six applications. The first application is long. And the other ones, well, who am I kidding? They're pretty long too. All right. But here's the first application. You, like Gomer, have gone after other lovers. What's happening in this text? God is angry with his people because of their prostitution. Notice Hosea chapter 1 verse 2. When the Lord first spoke through, through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom for, what was this whole purpose of this book for? For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. The nation of Israel was married by covenant to the Lord but had forsaken her husband and gone after other gods. And that is what we call spiritual adultery. In the Old Testament, adultery and idolatry go hand in hand. In fact, spiritual adultery is the primary biblical illustration of sin in the Old Testament. And I'm just convinced that your sin will never truly wreck you until you view it as spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery is when you cheat on God. Now look, most of us don't believe we have a problem with adultery because we associate it with the physical intimacy. But spiritual adultery goes deeper than that. Heart adultery is present everywhere. So the question we're asking is what do the heart lovers look like? How can we identify them? Heart lovers are anything that promise to deliver the things that only Christ can deliver. Salvation, satisfaction, joy, significance, peace, meaning in life. And that's what's going on in this text. Notice Hosea chapter 2 verse 5b. For she said, I will go after my lovers. Why? Who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Gomer is running after lovers who give her gifts. So Israel is running after false gods of the surrounding nations who give gifts. Now it's not easy to identify spiritual adultery in our hearts because these lovers go unseen. But I want to I point out some things that will help us to identify the lovers. Here's the first way we can help identify lovers. They promise to satisfy you. They promise to satisf satisfy you. Hey, get into my bed and you will be satisfied. They said it to Gomer. They said it to Israel. Two different lovers, but the same promise. I will satisfy you. Now, the lover for some single adults is marriage. 
You believe you can't have a truly fulfilling life until you're married. You just want someone to look at you like the NFL refs look at the Patriots. You know, I just want someone to love me. And, and some people are serial daters because they are terrified of being alone. And in their mind, the lover is marriage. It's going to give me satisfaction, significance, joy. For some, the lover is the ideal, perfect marriage. Here's what I've learned. If you are dependent on marriage as the answer, you will obsess because yours is no good or fantasize about a new one or even the death of a, of a the premature death of a spouse. Sometimes I think Christian movies and books are guilty of placing too much weight on the perfect marriage. Because the message is, get this and you'll be happy. The flip side is, miss this and your life is over. Jesus never said the perfect marriage will make you satisfied. Look, my wife, who's not here this service, she'll be here in the second service. My wife is wonderful. She cares for our children. She quarterbacks the home. She puts things in motion. She loves me under unconditionally. She is a wonderful wife. But she is a terrible God. And whenever I make a God out of her, we have problems. I want you to have a great marriage. I'm going to give you lots of tips today on how to have a great marriage. I want you to have a, a marriage that's a real reflection of Christ in the church. But I don't want you to put a weight on marriage that Jesus never put on marriage. You can have an awful marriage and still be satisfied. Because true satisfaction isn't found in marriage. True satisfaction is found in Christ. Some people believe marriage will satisfy. That's their lover. Other people believe that a career will satisfy. Give them significance. Give them joy. Give them meaning. Give them peace in life. And then they find out that a career is their lover. It's their heart lover. So let me ask you a question. Could you be okay if you never progress in your career? If you never climb the corporate ladder? Now, I've told you guys this before. My lover is ministry success. I want this church to grow. I want to extend out this auditorium. I want to have other campuses all in Kentucky and Tennessee areas where they don't have Christ-centered expository preaching. Now, none of those things are bad. In fact, they're all really good things. But do you know how I know they have become my lover? Because I think when I get them, I'll be satisfied. When you point to something and say, unless I, unless I have that, I can't be satisfied. That is spiritual adultery. That is spiritual prostitution. I will never be happy until our family has children. I can never be happy until I get a good health report, until I retire, until people at the job start to value my work. You see, when something is the object of your hopes and dreams, that is your lover. So your lovers, number one, they promise that they will satisfy you. Number two, your lovers promise that they will secure you that they will bring you security. Interestingly, one of the primary sins God identifies in Israel is that she looked to other nations for help instead of God. When Israel felt afraid or faced financial worry, rather than turning to God, they ran to Egypt or Assyria and said, can you help us? They were constantly trying to get other alliances from other countries. And you're probably thinking, what's the big deal, Kyle? That doesn't sound like it's that bad. You see, that, that's just the problem. There, there are things we do that, that may not sound that bad to us, but the whole time God views them as spiritual prostitution. So you say, it doesn't sound that immoral. But see, something else had replaced God as their trust. Something else had replaced God as their security. So here's how we bring it home. Where do you turn when you're stressed? What gives you security? Alcohol? Shopping? 64 cups of coffee before breakfast? 
The primary sin is not in drunkenness or excess spending or caffeine high. But it's in the fact that you turn to something else for comfort instead of the promises of God. Or well, one more, let's just move it into a different category. What about finances? What most gives you financial security? One of the reasons that scripture makes such a big deal about giving back to God is that it reveals who and what you really trust for your future. One of the ways you can test your heart against the the lover of money is to give generously. Actually, what is the one primary indicator of the state of our hearts in the scriptures? It's, It's not learning reformed theology. It's not your eschatological position with your pre-meal or post-meal, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I'm a pan-trib. I think it's all going to pan out in the end. That's what I am. It's not measured on your spiritual gifts. No, the one measurement of your heart in the Bible is judged by your giving. Matthew 6, 19. Where your heart is, there will your treasure be. So if you're primarily... If you trust primarily in money for your security, of course you can't give money away because your future depends on it. And when we do that, we are prostituting ourselves to money. So your lovers promise you satisfaction, your lovers promise you security, and your lovers can be pretty addicting. What do we have in this text? Gomer is a, is a sex addict. Now, what are sex addicts? They simply have an emptiness inside that leads them to do various things with various people. They truly believe that they are free, but they're actually a slave to the one thing that they think gives them freedom. And we are doing the same things with our soul that a sex addict is doing with their body. We are putting ourselves in the arms of another. Your lovers can't secure you. Your lovers can't satisfy you. That's the point of this text. God is saying they can't save you. Only I can save you. Application number one, you have gone after other lovers in the heart. Application number two, this is a message to gomers. You haven't out God's grace. Don't miss that Hosea's love was offered to a woman while she was a prostitute. She didn't have to free herself from prostitution to clean herself up in order to merit his love. He offered it to her unconditionally, freely, while she was a prostitute. And this teaches us about salvation. Because most people think they've got to clean themselves up, they've got to make a bunch of changes, and then God will receive them. Like, I've got to stop being a soldier, I've got to stop partying, I've got to stop doing this. In Christianity, however, (laughs) salvation and forgiveness come first. And then change follows. Hosea chapter 2 verse 15. Love this. And there I will give her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a, a door of hope. Now the valley of Achor was the first place that Israel committed prostitution. Israel was defeated at the valley of Achor. That was not a pleasant memory for them. That was like, that's the day I stepped out. So he says, go back to the valley of Achor and I can make it a door of hope. I can make your greatest failure a door of hope. Then a few verses down, chapter 2, verse 19. Hosea, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. Three times, I will marry you again. I will marry you again. I will marry you again. 1982 can be wiped away. There can be paradise between us again. I will, I will betroth you. Application number three. God turns Gomer's into Hosea's. God says to us, go again. Go again. Go again, Hosea. Because that's what I do with you every time. God wants us who've experienced the outstretched arms of God to become outstretched arms for others. To the parent whose child is a gomer. To the minority who feels oppressed. To the boss who feels misunderstood. To the friend who has been forsaken. 
to the wife who's been taken for granted, to the divorced person who feels like they walk around with a scarlet D, to the one whose life is plagued with poor choices and a prediction for the future, a lot more poor choices. God says, go again, go again, go again, Hosea. Now, I am not saying that your outstretched arms will change the gomers in your life. Sometimes, like the time in this story, they don't change. But I can guarantee you, doing this will change you. It will make you more like Jesus. And that's been God's objective through the whole process. Application number four. You can learn a lot about marriage from this story. Someone has said, love is blind and marriage is the eye opener. It's probably true. On our nine year anniversary, I rolled over in the bed and told Sarah, I'm proud of you, honey. She rolled over, looked me in the eye and said, I'm tired of you too, honey. I said, not what I said. Well, one man said, you don't really know the depths of real love until you've been married for 25 years. I mean, look, you can get along on looks alone for about five years. If, if you've been married for 20, 25 years, most of you haven't because the average age of our church is 26, but if you've been married for 25 years, I can promise you, you've been tested by doubt, disease, demands, debt, despair, and you've done all of that avoiding the big D, divorce. You've had to make some tough decisions and they were not all convenient. Now statistically, if if 10 couples get married today, five will end in divorce. Of the remaining five, four will testify that they are unhappy in their marriage. So if I were leading a marriage counseling today, here's what I would say. Why will your marriage be the one in 10 that will be happy? Matt Carter and Rick Warren, they both recommend going to marriage counseling even though you don't need it. Just because... You want to be the one in ten. And maybe you can uncover some stuff to make the marriage better. And I think that's good. Most people go to marriage counseling when it's too late, when things have blown up and there's no hope. I wouldn't wait that long. I'd go early, even when you feel like you don't need it. Now, if you have a pen, there should be a pen somewhere around you. Would you, would you get that pen out? I want to ask you to write something down. Write it on your, on your neighbor's forehead there, okay? Here's what I want you to write on anywhere. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. Now, love produces feelings, but love is not a feeling. If I hear one more person say to me, I fell out of love, Kyle. You don't fall out of love. You choose to love. Love isn't a feeling. It produces feelings. Love is a choice. If love was a feeling, God wouldn't command it because you can't force feelings. They're just there. Jesus commanded husbands to love their wives in a culture where there were arranged marriages. So maybe there were no sparks in the beginning. So our excuses wouldn't hold up like, oh man, the body changed. It wasn't quite as tight as it used to be. Or, or, you know, I just don't get that tingly feeling down my back anymore. Who knows if Hosea and Gomer ever had sparks or tingly feelings down the back, but he loved her. And he showed her. I recommend three things for marriage. The first is to extend grace. The longer you are married, the more critical you tend to be because the more comfortable you are with one another. So choose to cut your spouse some slack. You say, Kyle, well, what if they leave the toilet seat up? Well, you look, I can promise you one thing. I don't know a lot, but I know this. God's not sitting in heaven thinking, oh, you know what? I didn't factor in that whole toilet seat scenario. <laughs> I didn't think about the modern advances of toilet seats. And uh, you know what? You're good. If, if it's a toilet seat issue, you don't have to extend grace there. Hosea, pursue through prostitution. But if she leaves the toilet seat up, you just stop. Go on home. No. No relationship will last without forgiveness and grace. And when do you give forgiveness and grace? When do you extend it? When their flaws and faults irritate you. My wife says all the time, there, there are certain things she used to think were so cute before we got married. <laughs> and they're so irritating now. That's when, you, that's when you extend grace. One woman asked another woman, Hey, do you remember when your husband did that? 
And she responded in grace. She said, I distinctly remember forgetting that event. That's what marriage is all about. My wife has to show me grace every Saturday afternoon when I get PMS. You know what PMS is for a pastor? It's pre-message syndrome. And she gives me grace all the time. All right, so you wrote down love as a choice. Would you, would you write the second thing down? Grace listens. Grace listens. All right, here's a, here's a quiz just for the men. Do you know what the number one body part for showing love is? It's not it. It's the ear. It's listening. Listening. Quick to hear, slow to anger, slow to speak. It's listening. So my advice for all marriages is number one, to extend grace. Number two, to talk to and pray with your spouse. Our homes are little churches. And men, you are the pastor. So if there was a problem with the kids in the home, Jesus comes knocking on the door, the wife answers, he's going to say, could I speak to the husband? If there's a problem between a husband and a wife, and there's an argument, even if she's in the wrong, Jesus knocks on the door, can I speak to the husband? The husband is the pastor of the house. The husband needs to take the lead in talking and praying. Let's talk about talking for a moment. Parents, there are going to be times when you've worked all day, right? You're going to have to come home and tell the kids, I want you to play in another room for a while. Because mommy and daddy are going to do some talking. And you say, put the kids in another room. We're not in there. Will they survive? What will that do to their self-esteem? Here's what it will do. It will create a crazy amount of security in your children, knowing that mom and dad are going to take 15, 20 minutes every day as soon as they get home, and they're going to talk. And nothing's going to get in, in the way of that. They're going to spend time talking to one another about how the day was. Would you write this number down? 8,462. 8,462. Only one in 8,462 marriages broke up where they prayed together every day. Average is 50%. One in 8,462. Number three, guard your marriage. This next little bit may be more like a counseling session. Guard your marriage. How do you guard your marriage? You guard your marriage by living disciplined. I've never met a fallen person who says, but I was walking faithfully with God. I was reading the word and praying intimately every day. And then the affair just happened. But I have met several who admit that they were not walking with God in their spiritual disciplines at the time of their fall. Live disciplined. Avoid unwise sharing. If you want to invite trouble into your marriage, right? Who, who wants to do it? If we want to invite trouble into our marriage, let me tell you how to do that. Tell someone of the opposite gender the difficulties that are going on in your marriage. Because it will happen every time. Guard against texting and email flirting. Texting or social media flirting. It's like, God, it's not an affair. It's only jesting. It's just words. It's just for fun. Nobody really means anything. But I don't want you to see what I wrote. An emotional, affair, an emotional affair is an affair as well. So guard it. Be disciplined. Here's application number five. Don't pet your sin. Repent of it. How did Hosea describe sin in the book? Chapter 7, verse 4. A heated oven whose baker ceases to stir the fire. Just unique ways he describes sin all throughout. Chapter 7, verse 8, a flat cake not turned over. In other words, it's burnt on one side and it's raw on the other side. It's, it's good for nothing. It's worthless. Chapter 8, verse 11, like a, like a dove, silly and without sense. 8, 9, a wild donkey. 9, 16, a dried root. 10, 11, a young calf that likes to thresh. 10, 12, a farm instrument that plows iniquity. Be creative in how you describe sin to people and to yourself. Like drinking curdled milk, waddling in mud. My favorite description of, of sin is found in Hosea chapter 3 verse 1. Notice, and the Lord said to me, 
Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and who is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. Though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisin. The only proper translation there is to say hostess Twinkies, to get the ridiculousness. They left me for hostess Twinkies. They left God for a packet of hostess Twinkies. That's how ridiculous it is when we leave God for a career or we leave God for another woman or another man or the promise of something else to give us significance and security. That's how ridiculous it sounds. Now let me just, let me just speak bluntly for a minute about our sin. Don't feed yourself the lie that you are against sex trafficking, which is what's taking place in the book of Hosea. Don't feed yourself a lie that you're against sex trafficking if you watch porn. Because you're creating the market for trafficking. Let's bring it into another avenue. In my time of pastoring, I've heard people say, typically with me, I need help. I love God. I love God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve God. I need help. My marriage is about to fall apart. They're faithful for a long time. The marriage comes back together and then they're gone. The very thing that God blesses you with, you allow to turn you away from God. That is what happened here with God's people. Israel, chapter 10, verse 1. Israel was a luxuriant wine that yields its fruit. So God blessed them. The land was growing. The more his fruits increased, the more altars he built. Those were not altars to God. Those were altars to false gods. And as his country improved, he improved his pillars. Hosea ministered during a time of prosperity, peace, and advancement. Many people were becoming wealthy. Building activity was flourishing, which led to a, lot, a widespread feeling of pride among the nation. And we don't want to pet our sin. We want to put it to death. Why? Because chapter 11, verse 7 says we are bent towards sin. So we can't pet it. We've got to put it to death. We don't desire to play the whore any longer. And I want to say this to you just as lovingly as I possibly can. Because God's been saying it to me all week. Don't confuse God's grace and mercy towards you as him not caring that you sin. You have to take fighting sin more serious. What do we do when we're encountered with our sin? We repent. We turn from it. We go in the opposite direction. And that is not natural. Who among us likes to repent of sin? I don't wake up during the day or go to bed at night like, man, you know what? I can't wait to just repent of my sin. No. The Puritan said repenting of sin is the vomiting of the soul. It's not natural. It's against everything that we humanly want. We have to force ourselves to repent in prayer. We have to force ourselves to repent daily. Everything in you will resist it. Application number six. This is the last one. You were on sin's auction block. Now you can look at the story of Hosea in three movements. Our relationship with God is like a marriage. Our relationship with God is like a bad marriage. And then how God healed his marriage and what it cost him. Now you have in this story 100 fold if not a thousand fold reasons for divorce. I mean there are plenty of places in the Bible where they give you reasons for divorce. I have a whole sermon on what did Jesus say about divorce and remarriage. It's online. You can check that out. But that's not the point of this. Okay. So some of you are beating yourself up about that because something that happened in the past. Go listen to that. What did Jesus say about divorce and remarriage and the hope that you have after? But that is really not what the book of Hosea is all about. Hosea would be really upset if you looked at, at his book and said, love conquers all. That's what this story is about. Because this story is not about love conquering all. This story is about God conquering all. And how God heals his marriage and what it cost him. This story just isn't about Israel, it's about you. It's not just their story, it's your story. We were walking the red light districts of sin. 
so lost and totally ignorant of our sin and the devastation that it causes in eternity. When we were on the auction block of our sin, Jesus busted in and he says, I'll buy them. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you were bought with a price, not with barley, but with blood. That event is what we call the cross, where Jesus was crucified on the cross. He was buried in a tomb. That whole event was 800 years after this adultery and 200 years ago for us, or 2,000 years ago for us. God so loved the world that he sent his son into a brothel to pay an infinite price to buy you back. At the core of the Bible is about how whores can be welcomed back to a loving husband. One pastor at C.J. Mahaney's church in Louisville, when someone asks him, how are you doing, he always responds the same way. He says, well, I'm just the Lord's whore. I mean, talk about a conversation starter. I think I just walk right away. New church, please. That's what I would say. But you know what? He's trying to get to the gospel there. I'd probably start with a different book and get to the gospel, but, you know, that's an option. What's the truth here? God has bought you back. What, what was that event that he bought you back? It was, it was the empty tomb. He rose from the dead for three days, and he bought you back. And let me tell you something. Hosea didn't have buyer's remorse with Gomer. He wasn't regretting, like, oh, man, I just hate I took her back. No. So what created that in him? Number one, that is grace that is sufficient. Some of you are thinking, I could never do that. Well, in your time of need, if it were you, God would give you the grace that is sufficient. And it would blow your mind to forget at what you could forgive. Bring it back because you see what you've been forgiven of. But lastly, God has no remorse, if you're a believer, about buying you. He has bought you back. He's a faithful husband.